How's it going, creeps? Welcome to episode 24 of Cinema Creep, a Black Mass Films podcast where we dissect all things vile, disgusting, and downright terrifying in the world of horror cinema. I'm Justin. And I'm Andrew. And this is uh, our second official week recording in studio. Feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. I think it, it flows way, way better. It's not as... Uh, the way we were doing it, you know, when we were doing it remotely was just like... It was a lot of work. It was a lot of editing. It was a lot of editing. It was a lot of stress. And I feel like we put way too much pressure on ourselves to actually, I don't know, the way we were doing it just seemed very like uptight. To you me. know, the good and bad thing about it too, though, is we both are uh, known to go off on a tangent. And when we get together in the same room, we just fucking talk about random shit. Yeah. We're like, hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. What about this movie? Hey, look at this mask over here. Yeah. Well, when we were doing it remotely, that was hard because like we go off on these tangents and then like you got to like raise your hand over Skype or Zoom to be like... Oh, the delay? And we couldn't talk yeah. over each other? Yeah. Or sometimes like you'd go out. Yeah. Or like I'd go out or it would sound like we're in a tin can. The call would just drop. Yeah. So this is way better. Way better. So, uh, yeah. What have you watched this week? Yeah, guys. So I've had a pretty eventful week of watching uh, just a bunch of random stuff. Um I've had some time off from work lately, so I've been watching just, that's my thing right now, you know, like getting shit done around the house and then watching movies every day. Some good, some bad. Like I said last episode, I'm just finding a lot of crap on Prime uh, and finding hidden gems. And then I'm also watching some new movies too because I'm trying to to stay up to date with what's out there that people are interested in. And uh, one movie I watched recently that was was pretty rad. Um, it's it's more like horror adjacent. Like if you look it up on IMDb, it says it's um, crime, drama, and mystery. So it's sort of like a thriller or suspense more to me. Um, but it's called The Woman in the Window. Now this movie, real quick synopsis, is an agoraphobic woman living alone in New York begins spying on her new neighbors only to witness a disturbing act of violence. Um, if you're a Hitchcock fan, this plays uh, or pays homage to two awesome Hitchcock movies. It pays homage to Vertigo. Um, has My some Hitchcock film. Yeah, has a, a shot in the movie where the crane base the, the the camera basically cranes down or descends down the middle of a staircase, just like in Vertigo. And then does it have the dolly zoom? Uh, I can't remember if it does that or not. I don't think it does. I think it just kind of goes down. It doesn't do Still the dolly cool, zoom the thing, way. right? And um. It also is basically like rear window. I was going to say right? rear window, Because yeah. the woman is stuck in her house, and she's having to just watch out her window, right? Because she's agoraphobic. She can't go. She technically can't go outside because it's like a phobia or whatever. And um, you end up finding out why, and it just throws you through a fucking loop you, that you don't see fucking coming. And it's good when modern movies do that. And it stays pretty good from beginning to end. Um and there's some twists and turns in there that you're not expecting. And it has big names in it, too. So, like, it's no, you know, it's the acting is is top-notch, right? Because you have Amy Adams, you have Gary Oldman, Anthony Mackie, uh, Oldman's killer. and, and Julie, Julian Moore, right? So, big-name actors, um, director Joe Wright, writer Tracy Letts. Tracy Letts did Killer Joe with Matthew McConaughey, which is a killer movie. And this is based on a novel. Justin, I know you're big into uh, reading basically uh adaptations right so yep. this is based on a novel by aj finn i don't know anything about him i'm sure he writes some rad shit because this movie is pretty, i'll go check it out because i've been on a, awesome been back on a reading kick right yeah but definitely woman in the window it's on netflix uh gary oldman you can't go wrong there no i mean he's not in the movie a bunch but when he is he that's fucking weird he's like usually a, a big big role like i've not seen the movie so Right, I mean, when he, I mean, he plays, he plays a pivotal character, but he's not in the movie a lot, if that makes sense. And um, I don't know, it's just good. It plays, it plays a whole lot, makes you feel a lot of those Hitchcock vibes and a lot of those older, like nineteen fifties, like crime kind of movies. The way it plays out and stuff, it's good. I definitely recommend it for like horror adjacent fans. Yeah, sounds good. I'll have to watch it. Um. I've not really watched too much this week other than rewatching what we're talking about tonight. Um, in that I did go back and rewatch Adam Green's Frozen because, well, we're talking about Hatchet 1 and 2 tonight. And I don't know why, but like the last couple of weeks I've been on like an Adam Green and Joe Lynch deep dive. 
And I think it's because, you know, I, I found their podcast and I've been listening to that. And as horror fans and aspiring filmmakers, I highly suggest doing that. And uh, I actually do the $5 a month Patreon for them because they do a lot of their old episodes. Like they called it classic crypt. And uh, I mean, they, they do some of their older stuff, like their hall of fame episodes with like Joe Dante and stuff you can get on Spotify. But if you do their Patreon thing for like five bucks a month, you get a lot of cool shit. So, so I went back and rewatched Adam Green's frozen, you know, it's one of those, it's not like it's situational horror, right? It's about these, this group of friends, they're going on a ski trip and they get stuck on a ski lift, and the place is only open from Friday to Sunday. And it's Sunday night, so no one's going to come back till Friday. And it's like freezing cold, and there's wildlife, and all this stuff. Right. So, uh, it's one of those movies that does a really good job of not being stagnant while keeping everything in one, one location. And... It's it's got minimal characters, but it still it still works. Other than that, like I've really you know you were talking about uh, novels, so you and I both one of our favorite films of all time is No Country for Old Men. So I've read the book before uh, by Cormac McCarthy, and I'm really big on audiobooks because it allows me to do other things, work out or whatever, while still technically reading. So I went back and re re listened to the audiobook of No Country for Old Men. And it is like ninety percent of that book is verbatim, like what the Cohen brothers did with that movie. So I I definitely think that movie is probably one of the best adaptations of a novel. You know, I've talked to you before, like if if we ever do a remake, I really want to do Jurassic Park because as a fan of the novel, that movie is so far removed from the original story. But No Country for Old Men is like super true to the source material. So if you're a fan of that, as you're listening to it or reading it, you can fully picture the film. So that's pretty much what I've been doing. You know, the best thing about the movie and like the book, like you said, is when you have a villain like Anton Sugar, you know, like you think about all of the gnarly shit that happened in the movie and all of the, the ways that he, the violent ways that he kills his victims and then you sort of, you know, he just gets in a car crash at the end, right? And it's sort of ambiguous in a way, like, because it doesn't really show that he dies, does it? Oh, he lives. Yeah. Because so, remember, he pays the kid. He's like, give me your shirt. Oh, yeah. Like, and he, yeah, yeah. Because especially, so the only thing I will say that the movie doesn't convey as well as the book does, and it's not for lack of trying, it's just like the book is like an eight-hour audio book. So if you were reading it, it'd be, you know, anywhere between eight and a half to ten hours. Like if you were just sitting down reading it yourself. And in the movies, what, like two and a half hours long or something? Yeah. But in the book especially, they talk about how, especially Sheriff Bell, he's talking about how, you know, he used to think that the people they're dealing with now are the same kind of people the old-time sheriffs used to have to deal with. But then he's like, actually, now I really don't think that. Like, they look at Anton Chigurh as like, I don't know, like he's unstoppable. Right. So... Yeah, I didn't know if, like, in the book, if it ended the same way or, or what it was. Um, but definitely this is, when you look at it, this is my favorite Josh Brolin movie. I mean, this is obviously one of my favorite movies of all time anyways, Yeah, right? it's, in, it's in my top ten of all time, like, um, out of any genre. Yeah, same here. Um, but uh, Josh Brolin, like, it's got to be probably my favorite movie of his, you know? Um, I yeah. I mean, he was in Grindhouse, you know? Yeah. But uh, what else was he in? Like, I mean, I know he was in some... I mean, he was fucking... Wasn't he... Uh, he was Thanos. <laughs> so, yeah, know. he was Thanos. He was also uh, Cable. Yeah. And Deadpool. Um, but like we talked about in the last episode, like, those movies have kind of just... They all blend together. They got put on the back burner for yeah. us. So... He's also in Dune coming out in 2021, so that's going to be sick. Good old Dune. Yeah, that's going to be sick to see. But uh, other than that, like, have you listen to anything any kind of noteworthy music that's new that's come out or anything else that you want to mention uh, i mean i've i've been back on uh motley crew <laughs> no not after the last episode no i've been back on a a major census fail and bayside kick two they're two of my favorite bands but summer music man yeah it is but 
that tour in September. We've already got our tickets, so I'm trying to get you to get yours so we can all go. It's uh, the Bomb Pops, Hawthorne Heights, Census Fail, and Bayside. So looking forward to seeing Census Fail and Bayside. Yeah, so here at Cinema Creep, our uh, our music taste, they vary drastically. So there is, I can speak probably for both of us, Justin, chime in if you uh, don't agree. But growing up, um, I got into punk music pretty early in my life. And it went from, of course, like your your bouncy SoCal kind of pop punk to street punk. And I got really hard into street punk. I had a friend that was... By every definition of the word, he was a crust punk, right? Yep. Like this dude, Brian Taylor. I know you probably don't listen to podcasts if you're out there. Like he was the real punk out of me and my friend group. You know, this dude didn't shower for months on end. You know, he's he, like the straight up gutter punk. Yeah, yeah. Like he he would come stay at my house, but he wouldn't wash his clothes in my washer dryer. He'd wash them outside with the water hose for whatever reason. You know, and he would shave in his truck mirror. Because like whirlpool's was, not punk, dude. Anyways, like, he was straight up, right? So we had all these shitty punk bands that we played in. Um, yep. Good times. You wouldn't trade for the world. But uh, so went through my whole punk phase, and then I got into really heavy music, right? And uh, so my, my music taste goes from, like, that SoCal kind of summer pop punk, skate of pool kind of shit. To CD New York hardcore. To CD New York hardcore to death metal. And black metal. Like, it's normally people that are, you know, uh, music snobs or they're they're so, like, genre elitist, they don't really cross those two boundaries. They won't go from pop punk to, like, black metal. Yeah. But me, I'm like, you know, I I got a Bayside shirt on right now, and I might have, like, a Cradle of Phil shirt on or, like... Incendiary. A Dark Throne shirt on tomorrow, right? Like, you never know. Or Incendiary, right? Yeah. Um, But, yeah, so... I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm the same way. And then I also, like... What do you listen to at the gym? At the gym, it depends. Most of the time, it's like every time I die and shit like that. But Bot- now, when I'm like in the studio, like create, especially when I'm writing like horror films and stuff, like I get a massive hard on for like dark 80s synth wave, like John Carpenter shit. Yeah. So like let, that me, retro let stuff. me tell you the best band. I don't know if you've got into them. I don't know if I've told you about them, but um, I don't even know how many albums they've got. They've got like four or five fucking albums. Band called Soft Kill. You ever listen to them? No. You would absolutely love them. I'll check them out. You would fucking love them. And uh, I'm... Yeah, it's usually like every time I die and then if I want like really heavy shit, it's like Jesus Peace and shit like that. Well, Soft Kill is very joke. like uh, sort of if you took The Cure and mixed them with like uh, 80s gothic, every 80s goth like Joy Division and like... Hell yeah. Uh, what's that band? Bauhaus and like yeah. all of those bands like that. Like they're like that, except they're also like shoegaze. See, I don't know if I could work out to that. I could definitely. Oh, I can't like, work out oh, okay, to it. Yeah. But it's just something I've been obsessed with. When I work well, see, out, it's another genre. Like I like shoegaze too, and most people are just like, "What's yeah. the point?" It's just a bunch of ambient strumming and fucking like. Oh, you would love this fucking yeah. band though. Um, but when it comes to that's like my mellow playing in the house when the family's in the car kind of music. Um, but when I'm, uh, when I'm, well, my kid straight up loves like Gojira and shit. So really? I, I, yeah, I'll when put it on a- and she'll be sitting in the back going and Katie's just sitting there like, God damn it. Yeah. I didn't plug our key light in. I just noticed that, um, when I'm in the house, that's why right. I look dark. You can go, you can go do that if you want. I'll, I'll keep the audience entertained. When I'm in, when I'm in the gym though, it's all about like New York hardcore and body snatcher. Yep, Body Snatcher's good. Body Snatcher's the or shit. Or throw on some Black Dolly and Murder. Oh, yeah, of course. I got to plug this key light in. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm I'm the same way. Like, I got into, well, you know, I told you before, like, Motley Crue is actually how I got into punk because they covered Anarchy in the UK uh, by the Sex Pistols. And then I was like, who the fuck are the Sex Pistols? And then that led me to, like, Circle Jerks and Dead Kennedys and Bad Religion and The Clash and, you know, all of those bands. Well, hang on, I'm coming back because this is this is a topic I want to talk about. I know you probably can't hear me. Maybe you can. No, I can't hear you. Okay. So this is a topic I care about. So Justin has the Sex Pistols, right? That's his. Yeah, but it's more of a like I said, that was my gateway into finding punk. So that's the only reason that like I can fully agree that they are a problematic ass band, and Sid Vicious was a problematic ass. 
person. Well, I don't even want to get into that. I don't even want to get into the politics of Sex Pistols. But what I want to talk about is my band that is like the Sex Pistols is the Dead Boys. Yeah. If you go listen to the Dead Boys, uh, and you and you listen to like the Dead Boys, and you listen to the Ramones, you can see how many bands got influenced by those two from the late seventies to the early eighties punk, and it's just fucking amazing. And I think that. The Ramones, you can fight me on this all you want. Like, I went through so many years of my life when I was a punk hating the Ramones because they were a hot topic punk band. Well, that's the one everybody's like, oh, the Ramones, and then you see the presidential seal on everybody's shirt, and you're like, what's your favorite Ramones song? Uh, that Hey Ho, Let's Go. What's your favorite Ramones song? My favorite Ramones song? Beat on the Brat. No, actually, Sheena is a punk rocker. Mine's Poison Heart. Poison Heart, Yep. yep. See my cli- what I would consider a cliche answer is Pet Cemetery, which is because I love that fucking song. But I'm not gonna say that's my favorite right fucking song. Mine is uh, Poison Heart, and then the job that ate my brain because hell yeah, you know. But I think my favorite. No, see, as much as I love the Sex Pistols because that's how I got into punk. If you ask me what my all time favorite punk band of all time is, it's the Clash, 100. percent Really? Yes. Okay. Because they have fucking range, for one. And The Clash is also... So, get this. Even though I would never want to go fight in a war, when I listen to The Clash, I just picture it being in like an Apache helicopter, fucking smoking a Marlboro, fucking dropping napalm, being a badass. Can you not see it? Like, think of think of combat rock playing in your head oh, and being in like fucking Apocalypse Now. I mean, I can see it, yeah, but not I, in a real life situation. I'm talking like that's my cinematic brain. But you know, when you when you talk about that, it's funny because it always reminds me that like any Vietnam movie always has Credence Clearwater playing. Yeah, like every it's like fucking come on around the bend here. Can you some Im- napalm? <laughs> can, can you imagine like hearing that? Like, say you're Vietnamese and you're in the forest, and then you hear Credence. <laughs> Creedence Clearwater, that's the scariest shit ever. The most redneck hillbilly shit playing coming it's from like a deliverance for real. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're just your forest catches on fire all around you. That is the scariest shit ever. Yeah. Let's see mine would be fucking you'd hear London calling. <laughs> They'd be like, Which country's bombing us right now? <laughs> yeah, what? But yeah, so I mean the clash has always been that like I don't know. I like their aesthetic because all the other you know, the sex pistols, even though they were like they were punk. Yeah. They were still like it's almost like okay. Because if you ever listen to like a John Lydon or Johnny Rotten interview, he's one of the most punk fucking people you ever meet. He does not give a fuck what you think. But at the same time, when you look at the Sex Pistols, you're like, you guys are trying to be punk. Yeah. The Clash was just like, yeah, yeah. So well, see, that's the thing, though. I mean, you know, if you're a punk or if you've ever been in punk culture, you know the whole like fashion versus passion you know like there's so many people that are too obsessed with punk fashion and not living the lifestyle and that's why i think i kind of fell out of punk like i still love punk music but i was never willing to live that lifestyle like i've never been into drinking right i've never been into um using drugs which you don't have to to be punk but that sort of goes with the the gutter punk to me punk punk is like just doing what the fuck you want. That's I mean, what it's it like means. the fucking book I get you like got yeah. you for Christmas, the bad religion book. Do what you want. That's what it means, right? Like I agree with you, but that's not the lifestyle that most punks live. No, they and again, if that's you, why if you think about exists. it, that even kind of like you could almost even say, Yeah, you're a fucking like You're a sellout. You're a sellout. You're going to the, that's why and most people will fucking crucify me for the statement, but in the nineties, Green Day was one of the most fucking punk bands around because they did not give a fuck. Yeah. Like they got signed to a major label is why they got cast out. But right. they were still like making the music they wanted to make. Even their label was like, I don't know if you can put this out. And they're like, we're going to fucking do it. Like they had a fucking song on their fucking major label debut about masturbating. Yeah. Like that's what Longview is about. Yeah. And then actually the song, I don't know if you've like last time you listened to the album, but the end song where it's like Trey cool singing over guitar and it's yeah. like all by myself. He's talking about like, you know what the fuck I did the Jerking other day? It. You know what the fuck I did the other day? Guys, this isn't a music podcast, but just listen did to it. Did you masturbate? Just listen that's what to we're talking about. While. So, no, but that's that's maybe, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about, for some reason, I got caught up in watching Dave Grohl play acoustic songs on YouTube. 
And when people say Dave Grohl is one of the best musicians ever, I agree. Oh yeah, I don't. I'm not a like. I mean, there's like two Foo Fighter songs I like. Monkey Wrench, come on. My Hero and Everlong. Well, I'm a, I don't what Everlong? My Hero is my good. Hero. I I think of that like weird. I don't know. So that, that's a weird era of music for me. So he he has some old videos of him playing, not even like in a studio environment, but but it's on the Howard Stern show from the '90s, and he just starts playing his acoustic and singing. Like he he sings my hero and then he, i think there's one where he's doing everlong and the dude is just so fucking good like he only has well like, he's passionate too like he is a like he is passionate about the music he writes through and fucking through yeah so there's one where he's like it's a modern day video i think it was shot like six months ago and it's him actually telling the story of like everlong like how he came up with it and like where he was when he came up with it and stuff oh, and then he plays the it the story was probably was like it everlong it was ever long. Yeah, the story was literally like six minutes, and the song's like three, three and a half minutes. Oh, damn. But it's no. twice as ever long. It's just fucking gnarly, dude. He's such a good musician. Yeah. I don't know why I want to talk about Dave Grohl, but he's just I fucking mean, we're cool, dude. About music. He's just fucking cool. That's guy. what I'm saying. Like, and back in the day, you know, talking about Green Day, for example, like, I like Green Day. Now, granted, like, their last couple albums, like, I'm like, I don't, like, that's not Green Day to me because I liked Green Day for their sound, and now they don't sound like that. But people are still, they shit on them, and I'm like, why are you shitting on someone for being successful? That I think that's one of the things that I really stopped. Like, that's actually going to be a good segue into these films because for the longest time, I was a hatchet hater. Do you know Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day is worth seventy five million dollars? Jesus Christ! Anyways, go to Hatchet. But uh, or we'll talk about music all day. Yeah, we will. But and it's not even that I used to hate Hatchet. It's just that I was like, eh. I, I just couldn't get into it. It was like wrong current in all those movies. But then like I went back and rewatched them, especially here lately. You rehatched. I rehatched them. And I I don't know, I have a newfound respect for them because I watched I think I was watching them with too serious of a lens the first time. And I was unable to appreciate. Well, that's the thing, right? Like cuz cuz we've talked about it before in past podcasts where you have horror, you have horror comedy, and then you have shit that's just plain dumb and normally satirical satirical like horror doesn't sit well with me because it's just too like it's too silly, right? But see, the hatchet movies are satirical horror done right. Yeah, well, because it's not even that it's so much like comedy. It, but he's bringing like fun back to that genre. Because then you've got to think if you're going to be like, well, I don't want my horror to be funny. Then, like, by that, Deathgasm's a fucking terrible movie. Then don't ever watch Halloween 4 with the dumbass cops and the stupid sound effects. Yeah, but... God damn, that pisses me off every time I see it. I'm like, yeah. why would they do that? Why would they do it? I don't know. It? The fucking, like, cartoon... Yeah. Or that that's Halloween 5. Halloween 5. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a whole documentary about that. Like, the director did not want that in there at all. And the producers were like, well, this will be funny. Mustafa Akkad was like, fuck yes. Yeah. I'm like, as much as I love Halloween, like sometimes I'm just like, the Akkad family can fuck off sometimes with the fingerprints that they put on that franchise. But that's, that's neither here nor there. But so Hatchet, I was just, you know, I think I watched them. It wasn't the right time for me to check them out. And, Definitely, like, learning more about Adam Green's story and him as a filmmaker and seeing, like, you know, we are we are very much like that dude. And, like, learning what he was trying to accomplish and seeing our own, like, the struggle is real with trying to get shit made. So, like... Preach. Yeah, so when I went back and rewatched those, I'm like, I totally fucking get it now. So, that being said, the first film we're going to talk about tonight is 2006's Hatchet. So why don't you, uh, I'll, I'll guide us through this one since I've watched this one more recently out of the, the between the two of us. Why don't you uh, hit me with a little bit of the, like, who wrote and directed and who stars in this bad yeah, boy. Yeah, of course, right? So Hatchet's from 2006, guys. Uh, synopsis is when a group of tourists in a New Orleans haunted swamp tour find themselves stranded in the wilderness, their evening of fun and spooks turn into a horrific nightmare. Directed by Adam Green, written by Sir Adam Green, and it stars the one and only Kane Hodder, Joel David Moore, and Dion Richmond. Uh, yeah, so with that, this is also a loaded fucking cast. 
of horror icons. Like you just mentioned, Kane Hodder. It's got Tony Todd. The one and fucking only Candyman. Yeah, the the fucking Candyman. 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 You fucking did it now. Yeah, we're fucked. And, uh, of course, Robert England. Fucking Freddy Krueger. Robert England. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, granted, he's only in it for like the first five minutes. But still, it's like you've got Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, and the Candyman all on in the same fucking film. And this this movie, obviously, it's a slasher. It's a rebirth of the 80s slasher genre with just a larger-than-life fucking antagonist. And the kills are fucking over the top and ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, super fun. So, a uh, quick little backstory about this. So, Adam Green actually came up with the character of Victor Crowley when he was like, it was like eight or nine years old, right? So he went to a summer camp, sleepaway camp, whatever you want to call it. And one of the counselors, like they were telling all the kids, you know, don't go near that cabin over there or hatchet face is going to get you. And he just, he was fucking into it. He's like, oh shit. So he went and told all the other kids, he's like, yeah, hatchet face is going to get you. And they're like, who the hell is hatchet face? And he was like, just coming up with all this stuff. So he sat on this character forever. And the funny thing is when I was a kid, he wasn't called hatchet face or anything, but I have a character that like kills people on the lake again. Like I just watched like Friday the 13th and shit. So I had like a similar thing, but this is like obviously way more fleshed out than that. And now there's four fucking movies. Right. But, um, yeah. So the original script was called Victor Crowley and, uh, then he settled on hatchet and they, they tried to get this made in the studio. They didn't get it. They were like, why is it fucking funny? And again, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's part of what I was like, eh. Yeah. And then they were like, well, you've, you've also never made like a movie. Like, he had a movie before this, but it was like a $400 budget movie. Right. So it was actually his friend, Sarah Elbert. Uh, she was like, you know, we, we really need to fucking make this movie. So they flew down to Louisiana. They went on an alligator tour. It was him, Sarah Elbert, and the DP, uh, what was the name, Will Barrett. And they were literally just filming footage of the swamp, right? And I think this trailer's still on YouTube. You can go find it. And then they had a friend, or one of their friends had a daughter. So they wrote, like, the backstory of Victor Crowley. And they recorded a voiceover of this fucking girl, like, creepy-ass little girl, just telling the story of Victor Crowley. And they used that as, like, a proof of concept. So... So, the interesting thing about it was this movie had a budget of $1.5 million, I guess, once he finally raised the money. Yeah, it did not make that shit back. No, it did not make it back at all, because according to IMDb, uh, gross gross worldwide was $208,550. And if my computer will load up this, uh, the official website for the movie, according to IMDb, is myspace.com backslash Victor Crowley lives. That shows you how old. Well, I mean, it's 2006. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Harris is in the top eight. She's number one. <laughs> she wasn't even in the first one. That's weird. That's crazy. Will Barrett, Sarah Elbert, Jason Miller, and Andrew Andy Garfield. Almost said Andrew Garfield. Andrew Garfield. But it won't even show. Like, this site won't even load up Harley. But, yeah. So, one fun thing about this movie, though, is how well it depicts New Orleans. So, I used to live down there outside of New Orleans. And you know this was shot in the desert, right? Was it? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. This it, was not filmed anywhere near an actual swamp. Like, their set designer was fucking lit. Yeah, apparently, because I didn't know that it was shot in the desert. Yep. Really? What desert was it shot in? I don't near? fucking know. I just, and if you watch the behind the scenes, like the making of, they talk oh, about it. Oh, here we go. San, Santa Clarita, California, and Sable Oh, yeah. Sable fucking Ranch. good old, uh, Tenton. that's Santa Carla right there. Sable Ranch was where the swamp was filmed at. Where the fuck is that? What is Sable Ranch? Let's see what else was filmed there. Robin Hood, Men in Tights, Firefly, The Devil's Rejects, Lords of Salem, uh, V, Motel Hell, right? The Haunted Mansion. There's all kinds of shit that was filmed. Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, uh, all kinds of shit, right? I mean, I could go on and on. Pumpkin, Pumpkinhead 2. Which, that's wild because that's also, well, we'll get to that in the second yeah. match. You know, Ride'em Cowboy from 1942 was filmed there at Sable Ranch. Hell yeah. Well, so. Uh, the Butcher. 2006, we're going to have to... Anyways, just keep uh, on going. Shit, we're going to have us... Uh, Lawsu- lawsuit. You know, so pretty much, like, that teaser proof of concept they made, like, 
generated enough attention by like all these online, you know, like bloody disgusting type things, right? Even uh, Rob Tarek, is that his name from Blumhouse? Yeah. Uh, he he found it and he backed it and he was like, all right, well, this is like going to be a thing. And then finally enough word got around where investors were like, all right, we're going to pay for this. So then the whole, the Kane Hodder thing, right? Kane Hodder had not been cast in anything for a while or anything big at least. And then of course he was not cast as Freddy in Freddy versus Jason. So his last uh, Jason performance, that was what Jason X. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, we all have, you know, the same sentiment there. But anyway, so this, like, really brought Kane Hodder back into, you know, the limelight. And it's not even... I've heard Kane Hodder talk about the reason he appreciated it so much is... It's like, yeah, I'm playing a character that's in the costume and shit. But Adam Green also let him play the father of Victor Crowley. So he actually got to be himself. And cry. And cry. Yeah, which was interesting. Weird to see. Very weird to see. But, I mean, it's, it's a fun film, right? It's got all your classic horror tropes. You've got the the backstory, which is always like something that happened years ago, right? Um, so if, you, if you've not seen it, we're going to give you a brief little like run through, but we do want you to go check it out. So essentially, Victor Crowley, he was born deformed, and uh, him and his dad lived like they were like hermits in the woods, right? And one night, it was on Halloween, right? Well, first it was him and his mother lived out in the woods, right? Well, we'll get to that. Okay. Because that's that's second movie stuff right there. Okay. All right, then. So, in the first movie, you know, you get the backstory. These three, like, little punk-ass teenagers went, and they were, like, throwing firecrackers at the door, trying to get Victor Crowley to come out so they can make fun of him. House catches on fire. He's trying to get out. His dad runs up, picks up a hatchet, Starts like busting the door down trying to get him, get him out, but he doesn't realize that Victor is behind the door, so the hatchet goes in his head, kills him. What a dumbass way to kill your kid, by the way. Yeah, I know, right? It's like you could have been like, get away from the door. Why would your kid be standing there as you're hitting with whatever? Well, even that, I mean, you've got to like, would you not? I just had to like burp, but it burned. I don't, well, it's, I don't know. I just, would you not say, I'm about to bust a hatchet through this door. Like I'm about to bust a hatchet, fool. <laughs> yeah, get out of the get out of the way. Get out, get out of the front of the door. But he doesn't. But I guess this kid was like, you know, not all there anyways. It was like a mongoloid and it was just kinda like you well, know. I mean, he still even then like, he doesn't even give a warning. He's just like boom. It's Kane Hodder. It is Kane Hodder. He was too busy, you know, Jason in through the door. Well he's in. Well so so the curse is that he is cursed to walk the swamps every night looking for his dad, right? Well, enter these haunted ghost tours. And you you meet your cast of characters. You've got the, uh, what's the, is it Marcus? He's the dude that just broke up with his girlfriend. Yep. He's not wanting to partake in Mardi Gras, so he wants to go on this ghost tour. You've got a dude that's trying to make like a Girls Gone Wild ripoff called Bayou Beavers. Uh, you've got like this elderly couple. It's the dude, what's his name? Uh, Jim Permateo. Yeah. So And Shannon Permateo. Yeah. If you see him, you'll know him. Everyone, you'll, you'll recognize him. But they're all on this ghost tour, and then you meet Mary Beth, who you see her brother and dad get killed at the hands of Victor Crowley at the beginning of the movie. So she's there trying to get revenge. Well, of course, she tells the backstory and everyone doesn't believe her, right? Then all shit breaks loose. And then from there, it's pretty straightforward, like just racking up the kills. So what was your favorite kill of this movie? In the first one. So my favorite kill was when Victor Crowley kills the, the older lady, uh, Shannon. So he walks up to her and basically grabs her by her mouth, and the camera does a 360-degree pan around the back of Victor Crowley and yep. Shannon, and he basically rips her jaw apart and basically splits her head open. And then they shot it with, like, a weird shutter speed, so it like it's yeah. all, like, choppy. Yeah. It's really fucking sick. But, yeah, so the practical effects in this, too, are just, like, 
Like this goes back to the days where, you know, all the kills were just over the top blood throwing everywhere. Like there's so many shots in this movie. It's the classic eighties horror cliche of someone dying and blood, like just splattering on the tree. This movie cuts to that so many times, literally just blood splattering on a tree. I think my favorite kill is, it's probably that one also. I mean, the shovel through the face is still pretty cool. Yeah, and that one was pretty rad. Um, did you know that this movie was apparently the last production to shoot in Louisiana before Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina hit? No. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, because the, when they were, the whole beginning scene that is actually taking place on, like, Bourbon Street yeah, was filmed on location. Yeah. Not to detract you from what you're talking about, but I just thought that was pretty gnarly. Yeah. Well, that's, you got to think, it's, like, weird times. It's, like, even thinking now, like, We've got a pandemic, but you got to look back. There was a time before Hurricane Katrina was a thing. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, not to not to uh, stray too far away on that, but I was in New Orleans, probably in the Gulf Coast. Oh God, it was probably like 2010, which is a while ago now. Yeah. But that's even like five, six years after Hurricane Katrina, and it still looked like it just hit yesterday back when I was down there. It's just damn dude. It's just fucking ridiculous. Like trees are still bent over backwards and like shit's just all fucked up still. Damn. Yeah. But uh I mean hatchet, you know, like you said, it's pretty straightforward. I think this one for me, it's more about the actual like behind the scenes and the production that stands out to me. Um, I definitely like the sequels better. Well, the second and third. So, I mean, if, if you're ready, we can move on to Hatchet 2. Let's move on to number two. All right, so ha- Hatchet 2 came out in 2010? 2010, yep. 2010. Written and directed by Adam Green as well. Who would have thought? Which, actually, the third the third film's not directed by him. But we're, not gonna, we're only going to talk about one and two tonight, and then we will eventually do a three and four. So... What's awesome about Hatchet and these this this trilogy? I mean, there's four films, but the trilogy, the three, kind of kind of takes uh, kind of takes over, sort of like what Halloween did, where it's like one continuous storyline, right? Like it just happens. So one, yeah. two, and three all do that, right? With the Hatchet movies, um, you know, as Halloween one and two do, and like um, the other two big like horror franchises. I'm pretty sure I know that Friday the Thirteenth does it, and Nightmare on Elm Street does it. Does it? I can't remember. I don't think a, a Nightmare on Elm Street does it in any of them, but I could be wrong. It's been so long since I've like watched Nightmare on Elm Street like, like that. Marathoned them. That's something I plan on doing in the next couple of weeks. A marathon and uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. We should do that. We should do some killer commentaries. We should. Um, but yeah, so this right here, Mary Beth escapes the clutches of the Bayou Butcher Victor Crowley and returns to the swamp with an army of hunters and gunmen determined to end Crowley's reign of horror once and for all. So, yeah, so this is literally the next day. Yes. Like, she made it out alive, and... And by her, we're talking about Mary Beth Dunstan, now played by Daniel Harris. Daniel Harris, which... They changed up actresses. Yeah, they changed up actresses. I don't really know why. I didn't look too much into it. They got more money. Well, yeah, more money, and uh, I'm just... Uh, well, I mean, I heard somewhere, I heard Adam Green talking about him and uh, Tamara Feldman. They just, It just wasn't going to work, I think. Don't quote me on that. I don't want to like run anyone's Tamara name. Tamara Feldman was Mary Beth in the first one. Are you sure? Yep. Look it up. I'm about to fact check you. Fact check me. But because it says Amara Zaragoza. Then who's on IMDb? Th- Let me see. I'm about to. We about to find out. It's Mary Feldman. I don't even see. I don't even know who the hell that is. You made that name up. I did not. Wow, it was a it was a female that played young Victor Crowley, Riley Vanderbilt. Huh. Did you know that? That's Tamara a- Feldman. Look at that. Are you on IMDb? Oh, that's her stage name. I'm talking about her oh, government you're name. You're talking about her government I'm name. About her government name. <laughs> no, I'm going by Tamara or Tamara. Tamara. Which is, which is Tamara. It's Tamara. Either way. You know what I'm saying. He's over here trying to prove me wrong, and it ain't happening. Not today. Maybe not until we get to trivia of terror. It's the same person. It's the same person. That's what I said. All right, let's go. All right, but anyway, so now they got Daniel Harris, right, playing Mary Beth, and uh, 
I'm a Daniel Harris fan just because of the nostalgia of Halloween four and five. But uh, I think every every guy who who was a horror fan when they were younger was like Daniel Harris. It's kind of like Christina Ricci, you know. But I don't want to talk too much about this topic because I don't want to. I don't want to anger any hardcore fans. It, so let's. I mean, I don't. I'm not a hardcore Daniel Harris fan. I'm just. I'm a fan. Do you know she's only five five foot tall? Because I had to look up how tall she was and how tall Tony Todd was both because of the scenes in this next in the in Hatchet Two. Yeah, I was like that framing is so weird. How tall is she? He's six five. five. Foot. He's six five. Jesus. She's five foot. She's five foot oh. Five Jesus. foot even. Yeah. Jesus Christ. That's why. Like when he sits down, when she goes into his voodoo shop and he sits down, they're the same height. It's fucking hilarious That's, if you pay yeah. attention to it. Well, so anyway, so she's now, she's escaped. She comes back in town, and she goes to Tony Todd's voodoo shop, and she's telling him, you know, Victor Crowley's real and all this stuff, and it's because uh, the brother of the boat driver in the first movie, he works at Tony Todd's shop. His name is Justin. Yeah, and that's so that's an ongoing joke. Uh, what's his name? Perry... Look that up. Look up the the Perry Shin. Perry Shin. So the ongoing joke in the franchise is he plays a different character in every one, but he looks the same. It's a joke that doesn't age well at all. But we'll talk about that more in the third and fourth because that's where it really comes into fruition. But so he plays he he's brother, and he's like, yeah, we got to go out in the swamp and find your brother. So essentially, Tony Todd wants to get together a bunch of people and go out and get his boat back, but also has a, an agenda all of his own, right? He's wanting to put, put Victor Crowley to rest for good because it turns out Mary Beth's dad, her uncle, well, it's her dad's best friend, uncle Bob, uncle Bob, who tell me about uncle Bob. Uh, well, what do you want to know about uncle Bob? You know, who is it? It's Tom Holland. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, my bad. Yeah. I was like, what do you want to know about Uncle Bob? He's sleeping. <laughs> what do you want to know about him? So Uncle Bob is played by Tom Holland, who uh, famously directed and wrote the original Fright Night. Hell yeah, he did. And he directed the original Child's Play. Yep. Back before it became a convoluted fucking franchise. Again, but again, introducing more like... 80s icons and, and horror icons into his films. Yeah, because also one of the people who joined Tony Todd's lynch mob is, uh, I don't know how to say his last name, uh, R.A. Millihoff. Crucify me. I, I've never been able to pronounce his name. But he plays Leatherface in the 1990 Leatherface film. It's the third installment in the Texas Chance Massacre. It's literally called Leatherface. It's, yeah, Leatherface Massacre 3, yeah. So, so essentially the plan is to get all these people together and go out and hunt Victor Crowley. But you eventually find out that the, the dude who played Leatherface, uh, Tom Holland, and Mary Beth's dad. And Candyman. Well, no, because remember, he didn't go. Oh, what are you talking about? So the three Oh, you're talking about the three kids. Okay, yeah, okay, so yeah. they were the three teenagers who caused the fire. So Tony Todd's character, he's got this idea that if he goes out there and Victor Crowley can get his revenge on the three of them, then the curse will be over, right? Because it's it's not that he's an actual thing. He's a, he's a ghost that's cursed to walk every night that swamp and live like the night he died. So he's constantly just searching for his dad and he's killing everyone that comes in his path. And this movie has way more fucking kills they're non-stop. Yeah, non-fucking stop. Because you got this whole like group of people going out and it's just like a, a fucking a buffet being lined up for Victor Crowley. The kill count in Hatchet One was eleven people. Yeah, um, and this it's like sixteen if you count Victor at the end. So are you counting that? Um I'm thinking, so I'll come back to you with an official count. I have no clue what it is. Okay. Well, while he's over there thinking. Uh, so, as you can imagine, everything goes to shit. And uh, Tony Todd's plan does not work at all. So, this film, I think, has a lot more over-the-top call- or kills. And a lot of uh, 
callbacks to some really, really over the top eighties tropes. Right. So I think my favorite kill from this is when he steps out of the woods and he's got the chainsaw, but it's like a 10 foot fucking chainsaw. So it's like, you see the blade come out of the trees and then it cuts back to the two dudes that are watching it and they're like, ah, and then it cuts back and the blade is still coming out of the trees and then it cuts back to them screaming. And then when he finally steps out, that chainsaw is like two times the length of this table. Yeah. 10 minutes later, the blade comes out of the woods and he yeah. picks up both dudes. Yeah, he, pick, he saws through both of them. They're like standing, you know, like one in front of the other. And he's credit carding them. If any of you uh, former skateboarders out there. Yeah, yeah he's he's credit carding he them with up, the chainsaw. He goes through the bottom of their legs because they're both, they both straddle the chainsaw. And he picks them both up in the air with the chainsaw. And the funny thing is if you look close, you can see their testicles hanging down. Yep. Like uh, yeah. out, of, out of their ball sack. Yeah. And it's just terrible. And then he cuts them in half. And, of course, blood sprays every fucking where. So that's my favorite kill from the second one. Uh, my favorite, <sighs> there's so many, right? So my favorite one is uh, Layton, the dude that's that's having sex with that girl, right? Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And uh, so, guys, he, he's, <laughs> so he's, he's fucking this girl, doggy style in the woods, right? If you can call it that. He's just kind of. And, uh. So Victor Crowley comes up behind him and he he decapitates him and we when he does his body starts twitching. He goes into like rabbit fucking mode. Yeah, so he goes into rabbit mode as he's fucking her and she's she's all into it yeah, for a minute like, yeah. and blood is spraying all out of his head all over her back and stuff and she's all into it until she looks back and she sees that like well because he stops remember because yeah. he finally the spasm stops and it's just like come on damn yeah. it. And turns around and he's like, he doesn't have a fucking head. I would have loved to see that in theaters with an audience. Yeah, well that's. We got to have a whole nother like episode one day where we talk about that. Like I got a lot of feelings about the way that the movie industry is going and the way that movies are watched, but that's neither here nor there. Um, also like, I don't want to give away the ending too much, but, uh, the kill that Daniel Harris makes at the very end of the movie is brutal as shit. Yeah, it is. And that's yeah. what I'm saying. Do you count that? I do count that. Yeah. Right. It's brutal. Now here, here's the thing. I, I like hatchet two and three better than the first one. The first one to me, I feel like it was, you know, they were like, hey, we want to make a fucking movie. They did it. They did what they set out to do. It fucking turned out great. But the sequel, I think this franchise really starts coming into its own. Because now you've got the first one under its belt. And you've got the backstory, which then the second one fills in more of a gap. You know, uh, Victor Crowley was actually a product of infidelity. And... Tom Crowley's wife, she's on her deathbed. Yeah. And then she like realizes that she's been cheated on and she puts a curse. Which is sick, right? She dies of stomach cancer and that whole scene is like really gruesome. Yeah. You know? But so basically she puts a curse to where the the child is to be deformed and Victor's mom dies during birth. Right. No. She dies when she sees him, remember? Yeah. So he's born, and then the first time she lays eyes on him, she's like, "Oh, f what the fuck is Whoa, that? Fuck. <laughs> what the fuck is that? You're so which, ugly. Your mom died. Yeah, which takes you. me back to the first movie. I, as many kills and as much blood as in that movie, you know what the most disturbing scene in that movie is to me? What's that? When Kane Hodder's feeding like young Victor Crowley the oatmeal oh, or yeah. what the fuck ever it is, and it's just <laughs> dropping everywhere, and he's just like, "This is good shit." Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so I, I feel like the second one. It started to get its its footing and like re, it now has a story, and yeah. there's people you care about and you you understand the backstory, and I think the makeup in this one is better. Like the way Victor Crowley looks, I think Kane Hodder is now like really discovered who this character is. He actually became a character, yeah. You know, in this film, so in this second so one. well, then he also gets more screen time as Thomas Crowley, right? We see him cry more. We do. You killed my it, son. Yeah. Come out here and pay for what you did. There was even a tear. Yeah. You killed my son. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I, I like this better than the first one. Oh. And I, I, so Tamara Feldman, Tamara Feldman, like she did good as Mary Beth, but I mean, I, I like Daniel Harris as this character. I, I don't think it's the greatest performance in the world. It's definitely not going to win any awards. But I think it's because she's like really out of her element with the kind of character. 
I think that you're, I, that means, how can I put this nicely? I think that, which one of these buttons has that? No, that's hers. No, we, we still haven't programmed our buttons, guys, so. Which one are you looking for? You already know them. Yeah. So I think that. Uh, Even with that ending, dude? See that? So she has promise in short spurts. Like, I'm a fan, right? But she has promise in short spurts. And I mean, like, I don't like the forced southern accent. Because when you're around... So me and Justin, we live in the southern United States. Yeah, but we don't live in the bayou. I've been down there. I lived in the bayou. You've been down there on the Chattahoochee? Harder than a hoochie coochie, yeah. motherfucker. <laughs> but... uh you, you don't even know what a hoochie coochie is? Let me tell you about the hoochie coochie. It's a train. Is it really? Yes. It's a train engine. Really? Yeah, look it up. I don't want to. If I Google hoochie coochie, that's not what's going to come up. Look, I'm just telling you, I was willing, but she wasn't ready. Uh, no. <laughs> so I settled for a burger and a grape snow cone. Is that the lyrics that song? Yeah, yeah, dude. I only know that because I saw a meme the other day. It was like, it said, when you're willing, but she's not ready. And it was a picture of a Big Mac and a grape snow cone. And you had to Google it to see what it was? Well, no, I knew what it was just because my parents listened to Alan Jackson all the time as a kid. That's who sings that? Yeah. Anyone that doesn't know country music is listening to this part being like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, what kind of punk song is that? Hoochie, hotter than a hoochie coochie. Hotter, hotter, it gets hotter than a hoochie I mean, coochie. I don't listen to country music. Oh, well, I don't either, but. Unless you count. I mean, there's a few. Nick 13, come on. That's like some, Americana. I listen to some honky-tonk fucking punk stuff. Yeah, but that that's more... I can say, like, Nick 13 and shit like that's like Americana. Yeah, true that. Um, anyway, back back to the topic. Did you know that this film, Justin, supposedly used 136 gallons of fake blood? I believe it, especially for that last fucking scene we're talking about. Yeah. Which, about that, let me let me throw this this point out to you. I believe more... Now, I think Tamara Feldman did a better job in the first one, acting-wise, but I fully believe more that Daniel Harris's portrayal of that character is related to the brother and dad from the first movie. Yeah. Because Tamara Feldman played that character really... Or she played a character really well. But that's supposed to be like a straight-up white trash family. You know, like, they even make the joke. What's the guy say? Uh, the guy who's supposed to be the the producer in the movie, or the, the Bayou Beavers producer in the first one, he says, you know, most of them are all sleeping together, anyway, like, sleep with their family anyway. Like, they're supposed to be trash. I'm not saying Daniel Harris is trash, but she does a better job of making me think that character is. So... This movie was included on Roger Ebert's most hated list. Did you know that? So he has 50 movies that are on his most hated list or did or... Um, and I, I mean, obviously for reasons, right? Because any any movie that you watch that Roger Ebert hated or you saw him speak out against on TV back in the day or you see old clips of, they're normally movies that are overly violent, right? Um, but there's movies on here. Like I'm looking at his most hated list right now. I just want to talk about it because... Well, he hated Friday the 13th also. I spit on your grave, right? Well, that's not everyone's cup of tea. Joe Dirt. What the fuck? <laughs> Catwoman from 2004, which I understand. I understand that. Uh, I'm not going to read through all these. I'm just going to pick a few of them. Um, let me see. Flash Dance from 1983. Sure the still filming over here. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Hot Chick. 13 Ghosts from 2001. What the fuck? Right. Why is that on there? That's solid, right? Um, let me see what else. Deuce Bigelow, European European Gigolo. Not even the, male Gigolo. That no. was like the sequel. It's the sequel. Constantine, which is fucking gnarly. What the fuck? Two thousand five, right? It's probably because it was some like uh, religious kind of. I don't know. Baby geniuses from nineteen ninety nine. Baby, Ge oh that yeah, I fucking remember that movie. Um, let me see what else is on here. That's great. Uh, let me see. The Water Boy, which is fucking. Yeah, I cannot what understand the that. Fuck? That's got old uh, Veruca Balk. Veru Veruza Balk, yeah. Veruza Balk, Veruca. What the? Why to say Veruca? <laughs> <laughs> Halloween three, like I mean. Okay, fuck that dude. I'm never listening to him again. Halloween three is a fucking he banger. He died, right? 
Roger Ebert's dead, I don't right? fucking listen to his shit, so I don't fucking know. <laughs> You're not going to put Halloween 3 on a most hated list and have me knowing when you fucking... Tommy Boy, Freddy Got Fingered, The Village. Okay, this dude. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of shit on here that shouldn't be on here, but whatever. Like, how can you hate The Water Boy? I don't fucking know. Um, Or Tommy Boy. Like, those are staples. Well, that he was offended by the fat guy in a little coat. Possibly. Possibly. Anyway... Anyway, so this this made his, you know, he spoke out against this film. So The first one or the second one? The second one. No. Yeah, the second one. Oh, that's weird. Well, yeah, I don't know. I like either way, I like the sequel All better. Of them. I like the second one better. Um I think the third is my my favorite out of that, but like I said, we're going to do a third and fourth episode. Yeah. But yeah, uh so the second film, like I said, I think the story is fleshed out more. Like we said, it's it's the same night. Way more kills, way more blood. Um, one thing I do want to say, so Victor Crowley has actually become like, you know, he's up there. He's a horror icon, right? So I want to say something, and I've got a hot take for you. Okay. So if you watch Holliston, which is Adam Green and Joe Lynch's show, Kane Hodder does a guest episode. And him and Adam Green are like friends now. You know, he works with like the same people over and over. Adam Green keeps like a, a tight crew. Like it's Daniel Harris, Kane Hodder, Tony Todd, Tony Todd, all these people. He uses like the same DP. And uh, it's a way to do it, man. So in Kane Hodder's episode, he's making a joke about how he's been recast as Jason in Freddy vs. Jason, even though that was like a decade like prior. He's like, so now I'm stuck making these films for these wannabe filmmakers who have a, another Friday the 13th ripoff and think they've got the next horror icon. So he looks at Adam Green, and Adam Green looks at him and goes, nice ad lib, dick. And then Kane's like, you like that? So it's just it's funny. It's like a meta joke. Yeah. But because throughout Holliston, you see like Victor Crowley live shirts all the time. Yeah. But I just thought that was fucking hilarious. But... Highly recommend that episode. That's the one Daniel Harris is in. But here's my hot take, right? And I will argue this with anybody. And I'm not by any means saying he's my favorite or he's the best. Victor Crowley is the most overpowered fucking slasher villain. And in a head-to-head would be almost anybody. Including Freddy and Jason. And I've got points to back up why. If you're gonna try to counter that argument, no, I, I, I see. That's the vibe I got watching the entire movie. Is like how you know uh, OP he was, and I was like, well, like you really can't do anything, you know. Right. And I think it's intentionally written that way. It for is. Him to be like, like he's because that's one of the things that is cracking on the genre. Is like they're he's always also this, ripped. Too. Yeah, he's ripped as fuck, and like he's this unstoppable force. And then they even explain like every time someone's like, oh, just kill him then. And then she's like, all right, I'll kill him. And then later you find out, like, it doesn't matter what you do to him, he's going to come back the next night because that's part of the curse. So it wouldn't matter what Freddy did to him in the dream world, he's going to come back. Sure, like, you know, you've got, well, you can't kill Freddy, he's come back, Jason's come back. But I'm just saying in a head-to-head fight, like, Jason would, like, physically fare well against him. But if they're fighting in, in his swamp... (laughs) <laughs> it's a Shrek yeah <laughs> well even the tagline is like return to his swamp it's like Victor Crowley's tagline but in a head to head like Victor would end up just ripping Jason's limbs off and like hitting him with them or something because he's written to be that ridiculously like overpowered that's like in the second one you know my second favorite kill is where he rips the dude intest- dude's intestines out and he wraps them around his neck and he'd strang- he's like strangling him with him. And instead of the intestines just breaking from the force, he pops the dude's heads off with his own his head off with his own intestines. You want to feel old as fuck, real quick? Yeah, tell Sh- me. Shrek right came out twenty years ago. What the fuck? Two thousand one. Well, that's that was something else. Before we like move on, I was thinking about this today, and it made me want to. It made me really depressed. So you know the way that we look at movies like movies from the sixties, right? We're like those are those are classic movies. Those are vintage. Yeah, the movies that you and I love, like kids today. Like if you're like, yeah, man, fucking 
what's even a movie that came out like late eighties? Fucking Jason yeah. Takes Manhattan. Yeah. People are like, God damn, that's a fucking old ass movie. Yeah. And then I'm like, no, it's not. And then I think about it, I'm like, fuck, dude. Like, that's as old to us as like when we were kids, like fifties movies and shit. Yeah. It's like mm-hmm. watching uh like Dracula from nineteen thirty. Like, yeah fuck? or it's like so now i was thinking about you know like we both love the 70s and 80s and a lot of the stories that i have that like i've been we're eventually going to make films of a lot of them are like set in like 80s kind of thing those are technically now period pieces yeah like people are kids pe- pe- people are kids age you're gonna be like i don't want to watch that bullshit from like they didn't even have like iphones back then yeah they didn't even fucking have Fortnite. what the yeah. fuck like, what's that kid doing standing up? What is that a video game he's playing with, like, in a fucking arcade? Like, what's an arcade? Why is that idiot camping? Yeah. <laughs> camping? Yeah. The fuck? But, yeah, like, I was thinking about that. 80s movies, like, if we make a movie set in the 80s now, it's a period piece. Why didn't he just ask Siri? You know? Yeah. Well, by then, it's going to be, like, something else. Yeah. He's going to be like, why didn't he just have the hologram on his watch? Fucking. Yeah. But that's that's a depressing thing. Well, by then, you'll just get issued a gun at birth. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's in America, fucking, anyways. Yeah. It's like, it's a God given right. It comes with your birth certificate. <laughs> or, or your birth certificate is your concealed carry license. Yeah. You get one bullet, too. Yeah. One round. One round. You can you, take yourself out immediately, or you can save it for somebody later on. Yeah. What if you got, like, no, you just get a magazine every every birthday from the government? Yeah. You get one, one round and one magazine every. Yeah. But it's like, I don't know. It's just wild just to think of like, because when I hear period piece, I think like, oh, you're making a movie set in the 40s, like a World War II movie? That's rad. You'd have to be like 13 before you could fill up a magazine, right? You're still on that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. But what, uh, what if you couldn't buy ammo, though? What if that's like the only way you got it? You got one every Is it aging? It, yeah. Well, then you'd have to conserve a lot a lot better, wouldn't you think? Everybody would be a terrible shot. And, be able to and that's not going to happen because what you're explaining right now is technically, that would fall under gun control. It's technically communism. Yeah. So. Why are we, what the <laughs> fuck is this podcast? <laughs> but yeah, so that's my hot take is uh, back to that. Let me you tell know. you how we need to reform. Yeah. But yeah, Hatchet 1 and 2, super fun films. I wish I would have watched them with the, the lens that I just recently did originally but better late than never i think they're great like i mean if you're into whatever the fuck you're into (laughs) if you're into you know horror from the 80s you get all your icons in there right and yeah i mean you can't sit here and tell me man the slumber party massacre is such a good fucking movie and then be like hatchet's bullshit listen here slumber party massacre is good slumber party massacre 2 that one goes (laughs) but that guitar dude come on I mean, it's no Come BC, on. it's no BC Rich. <laughs> it's no Warlock. I, it's, it's actually really close to like. Yeah, it's like a Mockingbird, like yeah. a BC Rich Mockingbird. Yeah. What the fuck is this podcast? Uh, I like this though. I like this way better than. That's what going back to that. Like when this was remote, it was like we didn't have time for this bullshit. I think it's all over the place, but I hope you guys appreciate I it. I fucking love it. I'm glad. I you like, like it, it being all over the place. I'm glad because like, you're the, like the blood you're our and only hatchet. listener. Like blood and and like the blood and hatchet. All, all right. Well. With that being said, I give Hatchet 7 out of 10. I give Hatchet 2 8 out of 10. I give Hatchet 1 a 6.5. Um, and I give Hatchet 2... I got to give it an 8 for the kills. Like the kills... That's, yeah, that's what the, I'm saying. Yeah, like The second bar. one's more fun, and I think it's more fleshed out. And then once we get into like the third one, like I think that's where it's like... The production value is peak. Now, we'll talk about this more in depth. Like The production of the third one... Right. They fucking hated it. It was miserable. Right. For a lot of reasons. But I think the product is fucking But top, to, that's top in tier. part two of this. Yeah. So we're going to have a part two of the Hatchet franchise where we talk about Hatchet 3 and the fourth installment, Victor Crowley, Return to His Swamp. And that's two weeks away. So we're going to be filming that one probably on July 3rd. And you'll probably have that episode July 4th or 5th. To yeah. get you through your considered that uh, your Independence Day uh, gift from us from us <laughs> yeah uh, so next week we got something special planned for you and uh, you'll just have to wait and see what that is yeah but for now what time is it it is I'm not even gonna push a button <laughs> no we'll we'll put our trivia of yeah. terror thing in here it it is trivia of terror 
If you're new here, the deal is we have some cards out of the tabletop card game slash cards. It's a horror horror trivia game. I'm getting all tongue tied over here. We each ask each other three questions. We've got 30 seconds to answer them. Uh, usually we do pretty good. Sometimes it's hit or miss. So we will see tonight how we fare. So you want to go first? Hell yes, I do. So here we go. Let's see how well you're going to do tonight. Justin J. All right. Some of these are pretty hard. Some of these are going to be pretty easy. Are you ready? I'm going to hit you with this first one. I think this is going to be pretty hard. I know this, and I can tell you that I know it myself, but off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Like, if you would ask me yesterday, I could answer it. So, first question is, Justin, what is the address of Nancy's house in a nightmare on Elm Street, 1984? 1423. Nope. No, wait. It's You're close. 14. Oh, oh shit. You're very... 1426. 28. 28. Yeah. 1428. Okay. I technically didn't get it because we said two guesses. 1428 what? Elm Street. Yeah. Okay. But I'm not going to give it to myself because to be fair, okay. in last gotcha. week's episode, we only get two guesses because gotcha. three is excessive. I don't know why I said that last week, but I did. Hey, three's a... So... What is it? Three's a what? Crowd? Yeah, two's company, three's a crowd. Or is it three's company, four's a crowd? Either way, I missed the damn question. It's because I saw it in my head, and I saw, like, but I was like, is that You only saw half of the number. I saw half the number. God, fuck, man. Anyway, oh, well. All right, what you got? All right. Let's see here. No, that's too, too, too. I should already have these picked up. Uh... All right, you ready? Yep, hit me. What is the name of the murderous camper with a secret in 1983's Sleepaway Camp? Angela. Yep, you got it. Angela Baker. Yep, you got it. Yep. All right. (sighs) Name five horror comedies. Horror comedies, not comedy horror, right? Mm. Whatever you, they would define them as. Hatchet. Hatchet too. Hatchet. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, okay. Shaun of the Dead. Oh, fuck. Horror comedies. I get the clock. Uh, we'll count. I'm going to count Hatchet. It's a horror comedy. That's two. Uh, you can look around the room. John dies at the end. Look it up if you don't believe me. Uh... Bad Milo. Come on, one more. Chillerama. How the fuck did you not say Evil Dead? I don't know. I wasn't. I don't know. How the fuck did you not say Fright Night? How did you not say? Silver I don't Blood? consider Fright Night a horror comedy. How did you not say Frankenhooker. Okay, Frankenhooker's not a horror comedy. Frankenhooker's cinema fucking gold. It is. I agree there. How did you not say Reanimator? You have all the answers right here. I, yeah, I know, but I was thinking when I think horror comedy, I'm thinking more like. You got it. I'm glad you didn't cheat. Yeah. Comedy is like, it's a, a major, major element without it being like scary movie or some bullshit. Okay. What you got now for me? All right. Mm. What the fuck? Okay. This is a trick question. I'm going to throw it at you. No, I'm not. Cause I already told you it's a trick question. You can get it. Now. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. Diablo Cody. The screenwriter of Jennifer's Body won an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay for what 2007 film? You've asked me this question on this show before, and I got it wrong and I was pissed at myself. It's not a horror film. It's a film I talk about and reference a lot. I need one hint. That is Juno. Yep. We need to get more questions because now we're getting to ones that we've asked on the we got show a whole bo- We got a whole box. We yeah. just got to get more questions. So next up. week, we're going to shuffle through some new ones. So you're two for two, and I'm one for two. <laughs> All right. Um, this one, if you don't get this one, then we're, we're ending things. What horror film series features a mask inspired by a famous Edward Munch painting? Oh. Scream. Yep. Good. Glad you got it. What you got? What's my last one? All right, your last one. Ooh. 
Give you another stack if you need another stack. Yeah. Let me. No, you've already had those. All right. Let's see. Ooh, who directed 1974's Young Frankenstein? Oh my God, that's uh, I know this. Spaceballs. Taking a hint. Other than spaceballs. Nope. <laughs> Little bitty mustache. My mind's blank. What is it? Come on. A little bitty mustache. <laughs> I'll tell you, his last name is not Gibson. Is it Paul? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the fuck you're talking I, I, about. You're, I see where you're going, but let's say... It, is his name less Paul? No. Who? Famous, famous, famous actor. Last name Gibson. This guy's last mm. name is not Gibson. Mel Brooks. Yep, there you go. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I, just, I don't know how fucking my mind blanks. All Trivia right. is fucking bullshit. You're three for three. Nah, uh, I mean, well, you kind of handheld me through that. But, all right. What? I'm going to give you one that, like, I just looked at. So, I'm going to start. I started reading it, so I have to give it to you. What famous makeup effect artist created the zombies for Dawn of the Dead 1979? Tom Savini. Yep. And he admitted later that he regretted using gray for the zombie skin because it showed up blue on film. Yep. Yep. So you're two and three. I'm three for three. So we're fucking killing it on Trivia Terror. Well, I don't know. It's fairly I only saw half a, I saw half a number. Yeah, true. I you saw did. half a fucking you number did. in my head. You did. Hey, at least you got the 14, 20 something, right? Yeah. I would have blanked on that. Like I said, if you would have asked me yesterday. You would have said like 1408 or some yeah. shit. What is that? What is that song? 14, isn't it? Something Hawthorne. What is that song? No, you're talking 7861. 7861. See? Yeah. Good, good old beneath, me that. beneath the Sky. Beneath the Sky. Their only good song. Yeah. So, well, I mean, they had like one more, like Bury the Dead or some shit like that. It was pretty good. Good old Victory Records metal bands. Oh, yeah. Those Victory, those Victory those Records mail samplers. samplers. Hell yeah. Yeah. Or you the ones you get on AP Magazine. That's how I discovered Comeback Kid. That's how I discovered a lot of bands. Yeah. Aiden. Yep. Aiden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. We're dating ourselves right now. Yeah, fucking Aiden. What the fuck? All right. So uh, that has been episode 24 of Cinema Creep. If you want to follow us on Twitter, it is at Cinema Creep Pod. On Instagram, it is Cinema Crap. It is Cinema Crap. <laughs> Cinema Creep Podcast. And uh, we're going to start being a lot more active on there. I used to be pretty active whenever we were super active with getting the show out. But, you know, now with this new studio set up. We got to get back at it full steam. See, I think a lot of it too is us getting our bearings back and getting a little smoother, getting back into getting our notes done and fitting the movies back into our weeks that we're podcasting about, right? And I think yeah. that's once we get that going, we'll start picking it up on the social media again and getting those short form videos and all that out. So definitely be looking for yeah. some of those this coming week. Well, that and leading into this next month, we are going into production on our short film. So we're going to be super busy. But that about wraps it up, doesn't it? Yep, that's it. So uh, thank you guys for checking it out, and we will catch you next week. All right, see you.